Hello, everyone. My name is Ayumi Kumakriade, and I'm from the Zonneveld Lab at the University of Washington Bothell, and I'm here to present some research funded by the NSF on a cross-species comparison of coral microbiome structure and disease susceptibility. And so first, I'll show you this beautiful coral reef. And coral reefs are known to be these hotbeds of biodiversity, and they host many cool different interactions. And so one of the interactions is between, at the top, a coral, a coral trout. At the bottom, you can see a moray eel. So one thing that the coral trout will do will, is it will go in and snuff out prey, and it will cause the prey to swim out, and the coral trout and the moray eel will start eating them. And so corals are associated with microbes across their entire anatomy. So in the mucus, you can find Halobacteria borax, uh, in the tissue, you can find dinoflagellates and coralocolids, and in the skeleton, you'll find uh, osteobium. And so corals have symbioses with these microorganisms, and so I'll focus on dinoflagellates here. So dinoflagellates will photosynthesize and produce sugar, amino acids, and lipids, and in return, coral will uh, provide waste, so carbon dioxide, phosphorus, and nitrogen, and also provide shelter for the dinoflagellates. And so keeping in line with the same idea, uh, some bacteria can actually help defend the corals. So you can see two Petri dishes with uh, water samples in them. And on the right, you can see the control. And on the left, you can see the plate treated with mucus from a coral. And so you can see that they, the bacteria actually reduce the amount of uh, microbial growth that uh, occurred. And so, so you can, as you can see, the corals host many different interactions, and one of the threats to the complex array of interactions is disease. And so one study from uh, Miller and others back in 2009 looked at the tectite reef of the U.S. Virgin Islands back in 2005, right after a heat wave. So what they found was that there was a huge bleaching and paling event. So bleaching is when uh, corals will actually eject their dinoflagellates and effectively starve from that. So on the right, you can see a Montastria annularis that has been uh, uh, bleached. And so after this massive heat wave, there was a huge spike in disease because as the corals uh, were got rid of their dinoflagellates, they were more susceptible to disease. And so on the right, you can see that same Montastria uh, with recovering from bleaching, but it's now diseased. And so finally, we can see a huge loss in coral, as you can see from the bars, uh, from the bar height. So it went from about 25% of the uh, ocean covered with coral to about 13%, which is a huge loss. And on the right, you can see that the Montastria has fully recovered from uh, the bleaching event, but is now very diseased. And so disease is not only worsened by global stresses like climate change, like we just discussed, it is also worsened by local stresses like overfishing. And so one sort of overfishing is indiscriminate fishing. So it's the use of non-selective gears and like nets and traps, which often uh, capture more herbivorous fishes. And so herbivorous fishes like parrotfish, which are critical to the environment because they help eat the algae that are on corals. And so if algae uh, start to grow, uh, if, there's, if the algae population starts to become too much, the corals can starve. And so not all coral species actually suffer disease at equal rates. So here you can see on the left is a coral tree, a tree of the, uh, the coral. And on the right, you can see uh, disease prevalence according to a long-term disease survey in, uh, done in Australia by Dr. Julia Lamb. And you can see there's a, a huge amount of variation. Um, and so the aim of this project is to see is to test if there are uh, properties of coral microbiomes that correlate with cross species differences in disease susceptibility. So in short, we're looking at microbiome richness and how it relates to disease. And so the global coral the the name of this project is the Global Coral Microbiome Project. And on the left, you can see Dr. Vega Thurber at the from the Oregon from Oregon State University and she's collecting samples for the project. And on the right, you can see all the sampling locations and how many samples were uh, taken at each location. <laughs> and so the 
workflow for this project was first DNA extracting using power soil kits, and then PCR amplification of the V4 region of the 16S rRNA gene, then sequencing uh, using the Illumina HiSeq, and then analysis in CHIME2 and using the PhyTools R package. And so a big part of this project was to combine different, uh, different disease uh, data sets. And so something that I did was looked at the Florida Reef Resilience Project, the uh, Hawaii Coral Disease Database, and an Australian disease data set that has been unpublished from Dr. Julia Lam. And so I wrote code to standardize the disease names and standardize the species names. And then to, uh, all together, it created a very large uh, combined disease data set. And so here you can see the results of the workflow and you can see the huge, there's a huge variation in disease across all of the coral. And so lighter colors on this heat map mean that there's more disease and darker colors mean less. And so the six diseases we looked at initially were white syndrome, black band, brown band, skeletal eroding band, growth anomalies, and atramentous necrosis. And so one disease that I will highlight here that, show, it, it, that showed a large amount of variation in skeletal eroding band. And so on the left, you can see again, a tree of coral. And uh, on the left side of the heat map, you can see uh, skeletal eroding band. On the right, we'll see microbiome richness. And so we wanted to take a look. You can see that there, there seems to be some kind of relationship between the two. So where skeletal eroding band increases, a microbiome richness decreases and vice versa. And so ideally we'd like to correlate the two of these, but when dealing with dependent data points like a tree, we need to use phylogenetic comparative methods. And so the phylogenetic comparative method that we used here was phylogenetically independent contrast. And so using phylogenetically independent contrast, we found that skeletal eroding band, skeletal eroding band and microbiome diversity were significantly correlated with a p-value of less than 0 0.001, which is huge. And there's the R square value, uh, which is 40, 0.4627. So that would mean that 46% of the variation in the prevalence of skeletal eroding band can be explained by changes in microbiome diversity, which is insane. That's a, that's a huge amount of variation. And so finally, uh, we have determined, we have found evidence to support that the coral probiotic hypothesis is right and that microbiome diversity and disease are correlated across species. And so one study actually recently looked at uh, transplantation and seeing if microbes can, if specific microbes can test coral. And so future work should identify which microbes actually drive this effect. And so finally, I'd like to acknowledge the G original GCMP team that wrote the original paper, uh, Dr. Jolia Lam for uh, disease data and the current GCMP disease team. Um, yes, thank you.